Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. That love does not seem to extend to sports teams who oppose their hometown Phillies or Eagles, who shared Veterans Stadium for many years until it was demolished in 2003. This was evidenced by an incident where fans pelted Cowboys players and coaches with snowballs in 1989. Also, the infamous 1990 body bag game, where the Eagles knocked out nine Redskins players, including both quarterbacks, and the fans, of course, added insult to injury. In the late 90s, fan behavior had gotten so bad that Veteran Stadium installed its own courtroom, presided upon by Municipal Court Judge Seamus McCaffrey, aptly named Eagles Court. Court was apparently not in session during the 2003 Swan Song baseball season when fans pelted outfielder J.D. Drew with D-cell batteries. Makes you wonder, what on earth is in the water in Philly? Well, today we're going to get into that. Shout out to Mitchell, whose channel What Happened to Baseball put this story on my radar. Awesome channel, and you should support it. Also, a friendly reminder, please like and subscribe. Small actions that directly help the algorithm push this video out to other viewers. April 10th, 1971. Veterans Stadium. The replacement to Scheib Park, aka Connie Mack Stadium, is officially open for business, as the Phillies host the Expos in front of a capacity crowd. The Expos brought down a dog sled for the occasion. Phillies backup catcher Mike Ryan tracks down the first game ball, which is dropped out of a helicopter. No easy feat. Harry Callis makes his debut as the play-by-play -play man, Don Money hits the stadium's inaugural home run, and Hall of Famer Jim Bunning gets the win 4-1. The new stadium becomes the fourth National League stadium to utilize AstroTurf. The previous year's National League championship between the Reds and the Pirates had gone into the history books as the first postseason series played exclusively on AstroTurf. The Reds and Pirates were of course preceded in their turf grass alterations by the Houston Astros, who had opened the Astrodome in 1965 with natural grass, but were forced to paint the roof as a player safety measure because fly balls weren't visible from the vantage point of the outfielders. Seems important. This killed the grass, and the astronaut grounds crew had to make a quick pivot to chem grass a product that would promptly change its name after being utilized by the Astros. The Astrodome was nicknamed the 8th wonder of the world. Many felt that artificial turf was in the running for the ninth wonder. It was a period of rapid scientific innovation, but as we'd see in some of the other contemporary breakthrough innovations of that time period, like metal-on-metal -metal hip implants, Colgate brand lasagna, or the Ford Pinto, which was known to literally fucking explode, AstroTurf made things easier on the grounds crews. You didn't have to mow it, of course, but one thing our noble scientists didn't really look out for or didn't properly mitigate if they were aware, AstroTurf is made of the most toxic, environmentally destructive chemicals we've ever created. Veterans Stadium, or The Vet, would see the Phillies win three pennants in its lifetime, the first taking place in 1980. This would result in their only World Series win of the three, where they defeated the Royals. Mike Schmidt would be named World Series MVP, and Tug McGraw would strike out Willie Williams to seal the deal in Game 6 in front of a record television audience of 54.9 million, ending a franchise championship drought of 77 years. Phillies fan favorite, backup catcher, and eventual coach John Vukovic still managed to be in on that dog pile. The Phillies also won the 83 NL pennant, Mike Schmidt's bat would go cold in the I-95 World Series, and the Orioles would win it in five games. Arguably the Phillies' most memorable team, a youthful cast of mulleted characters, would win the National League in 1993 by stunning a Braves team with 104 wins and what seemed like every 90s Cy Young winner in their rotation. Memories and legends were made in Philadelphia that season, like three-time All-Star Darren Dalton, who finished 7th in NL MVP voting that season and sported the most clutch bat of the postseason. A particularly strong season was also turned in by Dalton's battery mate, lefty reliever David West, who sported a career-best 2.92 ERA that season. And who could forget John Crook, a man who seemed to simply have more fun at the ballpark than anyone in the history of the game, all while producing in offensive stack columns. The Phillies would fall to the Blue Jays in that World Series, but on top of overcoming disappointment, 
Crook was also staring down a very serious diagnosis of testicular cancer during spring training of 1994. Disclaimer, no story involving cancer is funny, but this is the closest thing. You see, this would have gone undetected had Mitch Williams, aptly named Wild Thing, had not made an errant throw on a pickoff move that shattered John Crook's protective cup and promptly got him medical attention where the issue was discovered by the Phillies team doctor. Crook would miss time that season after a dramatic opening day, but would ultimately be fine. As years have gone by, Crook, a baseball lifer, has watched six Phillies legends and former teammates pass away to a quickly metastasizing form of brain tumor called glioblastoma. Ken Brett, notable for not only being George Brett's brother, but also the youngest player to ever pitch in the World Series, turned phenom status with the Red Sox into a 14-year career that made a stop in Veterans Stadium in the 70s. He passed away in 2003 after a long battle with glioblastoma brain cancer. The same year Ken Brett got his call up, catcher Johnny Oates would debut for the Orioles. He too would go on to join the Phillies in the 70s. He too would lose a battle with brain cancer the year after Ken Brett. That same year, 2004, the aforementioned Tug McGraw would pass away, same story, glioblastoma brain cancer. He was an absolute staple on those 70s Phillies teams. One of many famous Tug quotes taken from his autobiography, Screwball, when asked if he preferred grass or astroturf, Tug replied, I don't know, I've never smoked astroturf. What a plot twist that astroturf is now being implicated as a possible culprit for his death. His son Tim's number one hit, Live Like You Were Dying, was recorded in his honor. The accompanying music video would feature clips from the 1980 World Series. John Vukovic, who would be one of few Phillies to go to the World Series as both a player and coach, would seemingly beat glioblastoma in 2001, but it returned in 2007, and he'd fail to see another championship banner brought back to Philly in 2008. Darren Dalton would see a similar fate, initially thinking he had beaten brain cancer after surgery in 2015, only for it to resurface and take his life in 2017. It was this tragedy that seemingly exposed the pattern here, and drove the scientific discourse on what all the players had in common throughout their careers. The sixth former Philly pitcher David West passed away last year, 2022. Other major leaguers who've died of the same cancer include Gary Carter, Dan Quisenberry, and Bobby Mercer. With Veterans Stadium being a potential common denominator in these deaths, speculation began that something was off about the field. The Phillies organization began to inquire about this as it pertained to the health plans of their retired players. In a great piece of investigative journalism, the Philadelphia Inquirer took to eBay to buy up old pieces of veteran stadium turf that had been handed out to fans as a game day promotion and had lab analysis done on them. What they found was a presence of 16 different polyfluoroalkyl chemicals, or PFAS, known more commonly as forever chemicals, because once they enter the body of a living organism, they circulate throughout, but never leave. They just kind of accumulate there. It's estimated that these exist in the blood of over 99% of U.S. citizens, at least in trace amounts. These chemicals also never degrade in our rivers and reservoirs, so our steady intake of them through our drinking water aids in this bioaccumulation. The EPA is required to map higher concentrations of PFAS throughout the country. As you see here, West Virginia, where I'm located and where many of the first lawsuits against DuPont Chemical in relation to PFAS originate from, it's a hotbed, to no surprise. You'll also notice Philadelphia has a similar forever chemical presence thanks to its industrial legacy. Long story short on DuPont, farmers here in West Virginia were noticing rapid physical deterioration in their livestock just downstream on the Ohio River from where these chemicals were being mass produced. Similar adverse effects would eventually be documented in the people of these communities. Birth defects in children were staggeringly high. For more on this, the movie Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo is based on this. It's a great film. Just this year, West Virginia Governor Jim Justice signed the PFAS Protection Act, which aims to serve as an action plan aided by $19 million in federal funding to research and renovate the public water infrastructure here. Like the old saying, you are what you eat, you're literally what you drink. 
For example, you'd be amazed what shows up in fish tissue samples, since they're living in our effluent. Name an illicit drug, you'll find trace amounts of it in freshwater fish. Due to agricultural practices and the prevalence of birth control, there are also more hormones in the water than ever, which, you know... Putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! But seriously, male fish gradually switching genders because of their environment is well documented. This is all a painful reminder that as our society develops, we use and abuse nature at a rate where we often face the consequences decades before we actually understand them. As with anything that probably involves the biggest public health lawsuits of our lifetimes, physicians are hesitant to outright say that forever chemicals are linked to glioblastoma in humans, but they are linked to cancer in other mammals, both wild and domesticated, in reputable scientific literature. It's an especially depressing situation because we, as individuals at this point in time, can do very little to protect ourselves from what we can't see. Back to AstroTurf, it's theorized that when artificial turf fields heat up in excess of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, baseball weather, we're most susceptible to take on PFAS through the air we breathe. This could suggest why glioblastoma detection in Eagles players isn't as high as Phillies players as they played there in a generally cooler time of year. Other possible factors such as general sun exposure and more prevalence of spit tobacco use by baseball players of that era could also be factors and are most likely not mutually exclusive from the effects of the artificial turf. NFL players are currently making a push to ban artificial turf because of its link to debilitating injuries such as ACL and MCL tears. But in baseball, the Rangers, Diamondbacks, and Marlins have all recently switched to AstroTurf from real grass. It seems it's making a comeback. As for the lower levels of these respective sports, AstroTurf is becoming wildly popular at the collegiate and high school levels because of the ease of maintenance. Has the chemical composition of modern turf improved from that of veteran stadium from a public health standpoint? It's hard to say, but the idea of our kids spending all summer on these fields could, and probably should, make you feel just a bit uneasy.